So perfect. Uh, welcome to everyone that's joined us. And um, again, uh, Friday night and uh, episode 69. You are number 69, like 69 dudes, little uh, Bill and Ted's um, banter for you there. Um, yeah, massive thanks to, to Mike for joining us on a Friday night, episode 69. And we're talking about, um, we're going to call them online, con I think that the episode was referred to as online consultations, but you could call them remote consultations, digital consultation, consultations tele telehealth telemedicine i've heard all these things get thrown around but essentially the the interaction between clinician and patient when when they're not in the same room um that's kind of what we're going to be talking about and uh, it, it seems to be uh, you know a topic of kind of necessity at the moment and this isn't by no means a new a new thing it's been around many years um we've got mike on here because he's been doing them for several years as have a lot of my physiotherapy colleagues but i don't know personally of, of many podiatrists that have been doing them in earnest for that long maybe only the last week or two because of I guess uh, the way uh, the the world is and the way most of our clinics have been shut down uh, particularly if we're not doing essential uh, uh, key worker type work and certainly in the musculoskeletal field I find myself seeing no patients face to face whatsoever I know a lot of our, our colleagues watching are, are doing the same thing so it's it's a topic of necessity so we we've we've we're, we're, we're really welcome, uh, welcoming Mike to, to talk us through his, his gems. Hopefully, we're all new to this, but he isn't. So we can go through uh, his experience. We can, we can learn from his mistakes and, and hopefully hit the ground running uh, a, bit, a bit better. Um, so we're going to really talk, talk about everything we can, we can think of, really, with regard to doing online consultations or, or remote consultations. Some of the, some of the legal aspects, um, some of the ways we can do it, the platforms or the technology we can use, uh, how to set up things or tee things up, things that need to be in place before we do this um, logistically, and then what the consultation may look like, uh, sort, of, sort of just before the consultation, during the consultation, and obviously where, what happens after the consultation. Uh, if you are watching, and there's 36 of you that are at the moment, um, please do feel free to fire away uh, you know, while we've got Mike here, uh, ask him some questions. You may have some questions that, that we haven't thought of, so just drop them in the comments and, and, um, and we'll obviously, we'll try and get to them. So Mike, thank you again for joining us. Massive, massively appreciate it. You know, I've been meaning to get you on this, or Craig and I have been meaning to get you on this for ages. And because there's, too many, there's so many strings to your bow, I just wasn't sure. I was like, we're going to get Mike on at some point, but what's it going to be? You know, is it going to be his strength and conditioning work? Is it going to be his endurance stuff, his military background? Uh, I feel like this is, you know, um, we're probably going to have to get you back on again because you're far more interesting than, than just online consultations, but we massively, massively value your, your experience in it. So do you mind by starting us off with the really exciting and sexy stuff, which, which we don't really like to talk about, but we need to, which is some of the legal considerations. So things like um, our record keeping, uh, GDPR compliance, all the things that clinic, clinicians and cl clinic owners are completely familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, could we just talk about how some of these legal things uh, are, are sort of um, appropriate uh, to these remote consultations as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for the invite, guys. Um, I th Having done a few of these webinars and these talks over the last couple of weeks on, on my experience, one of the analogies that I've sort of come up with off the cuff is a lot of people are scared of this stuff and they think it's completely different. And a really nice way to try and get your head around it is it's just like driving a car in a foreign country. Effectively, situation changes. There's a couple of little things that, that are tweaked, but the fundamental skills that you do you use to drive a car still apply. So when we chat about the legal stuff, then exactly the same thing applies. You need to make sure that the usual checks and measures are in place for your country, um, for the people that you see. And as much as we could open a can of worms and talk about all the legalities, the take home message really is check with your insurers, check with your regulating bodies and make sure that you are covered but make sure you specify the scope that you're going to work in. So for example, in the UK as a physio and the Chartered Society have given us uh, a new updated outline in the last couple of weeks in response to everything that's gone on, which pretty much gives us a nice remit of how we should work within, within the UK. However, what this platform allows us to do is speak to anyone anywhere in the world. Now, um, 
my background using online work is through coaching and training predominantly. When I had athletes overseas, they were away on training camps or, or living and training overseas. So there was a slightly different avenue there, but it has morphed into my treatment and my therapist's life. And depending on who I'm speaking to where, then I do have a few little things I have to check when I'm speaking to different people. I know in the US, for example, state legislature governs more than national legislature so therefore uh, the US guys need to be very very careful when they're speaking or consulting with someone in a different state to themselves they need to make sure they're covered and legal legal to do that but all the usual legal stuff um, apply I think um, check your liability insurance make sure it covers online work in the first place and then the nitty-gritty of the T's and C's because certain people will have restrictions or limitations on that policy and we would be second guessing what those are specifically to certain people so just just check it um also it's a practical consideration with with the legal side of it is remember that there's confidentiality and there's privacy that is put in place when people come normally to your clinic the space that you use the protection of the software that you use all of those things still apply in an online format so GDPR here in the UK, HIPAA in the US, they all still apply. Um, when I first started doing this, I would set everything up what I thought was appropriate my end. And then I would dial in the client or the patient and I'd find out they're sitting in, in the middle of a coffee or a coffee shop. <laughs> or their kids and wife would be sitting in the background doing something else. And there's you trying to hold a professional, medical, confidential conversation with them. And I often had to sort of say, look, we're going to have to pause there. And, and because the guy in the coffee shop was on a, on a public Wi-Fi, um, the guy that had his family and friends running around behind him, just, it just to me, the professionalism was, I don't feel safe and comfortable holding this medical conversation with you in this environment. Would you mind please go into to a safe environment that's, that, that complies? Um, and again, the legal stuff of, um, so consent-wise, there is a lot of people who are quite happy to accept when say people are uh, talking the, the regulators, the fact someone accepts that invitation and then activates your call is, is, is enough in a lot of people's eyes to gain consent that they're prepared to undertake this. But some people like to verbally get it. We have a record facility, which I know we're going to talk about later, but if you are recording it, then legally make sure you ask for consent to record it but know that their consent is recorded at the same time. Um, but some people send sort of pre-assessment, pre-consultation paperwork. Some of that may have a legal or uh, consent-based component. So it really is that it should be as similar as possible to what you would have in a normal running day-to-day face-to-face clinic. But you really do need to check that um, the physical setup of everything is legal and confidential and likewise um, the limitations and restrictions on your liability insurance you're complying with those and the best way to do that is speak to your regulating body speak to your insurers perfect great um so sort Actually, of on sorry, the sorry line. can i can i just jump jump in there and just so, so, yeah. something just occurred to me what should we be calling this um online consultations telehealth telemedicine what's the like, like I heard someone say recently, it shouldn't be called telehealth because it's akin to telemarketing. But what's the appropriate terminology? So I've, I've always, I, I use online consultations, online follow-ups, mm. online mm. coaching, mm. mainly because I want them to understand it's exactly the same services I'm offering, but it's mm. in an online forum. The platform and the medium that I'm going to speak into these people is changing. So the, the least amount of change that I have to enforce on them is, is what I feel comfortable with. Um, I want them to understand what, what the, the session is. Telehealth is confusing for a lot of people. Um, and, and I think, like most things, we've, you know, tomato, tomato, people will call it different things, but I, I just call it an online consultation. Um, if I had, so on my booking system, I use an online booking system, and on that, it's online assessment or online follow up, as it would be if they were coming in or ringing the clinic and saying, I want to see. Are you a new patient? It's an assessment. Are you a follow-up? It's a follow-up for an existing client. So, 
So um, it's as simple as, as it is in clinic with the word online thrown in front. Perfect. And let's talk about, let's talk about the platforms um, because there's lots of, lots of different platforms out there. And I'll just list some of the ones that, that certainly have, have been sp- are being spoken about in recent weeks that the most, and you may not, you may know of some others. And if we could just go through your experience with them and, and some of the pros, some of the cons, um, obviously it would be a miss not to talk about zoom because we're using zoom right now. Uh, Craig and I have used zoom for two years now. Um, kicking ourselves that we didn't buy shares in it um because it's just <laughs> everyone's talking about it now i've got friends that never even heard of zoom a week ago that are now using it um so zoom seems to be uh or certainly in the, in the circles i keep the one that feels most popular fairly closely followed by skype i think skype has the advantage of being so well known by by everyone um although i've definitely found it to be glitchy when i uh even when i speak to my my uh, relatives at christmas it could be a bit glitchy so we've got zoom we've got skype um I know that there is, I was made aware of um, Rehab My Patients, which I think at the moment are do, currently doing three months completely free, um, which I will put a link to beneath. Uh, I know in America, uh, it's very, Doxy Me is very popular. Um, I think it's the one um, that, that uh, a lot of the American podiatrists are using uh, because it, it complies with their regulations. We've got Rehab Guru. I know that Clinico, the medical notes system, have just recently announced that they are uh, embedding uh, the, the telehealth. There it is, the telehealth thing within their system. So we have options, I guess, is the point. So um, how do we choose? Does it matter? Uh, what, what's the, are, are they all more similar than they are different? Okay, so um, as far as the way I operate, I have a number of those as my options. My preferred option is Zoom. I'll explain why in a second, but ultimately I use whatever my clients are most comfortable using. Like I said earlier, we're, we're changing the landscape of the session and I want it to be as smooth and as easy as they can. We'll all picture patients and clients of ours that are more or less familiar and comfortable with technology than others. Therefore having simple options is the key. So I've done them over a telephone call. I've done them over FaceTime. I've done them over Skype. So a lot of the time I ask the client, what are you most comfortable using? If I've got a 70 year old athlete who has set up Skype or FaceTime because they speak to the grandkids once a week, then me trying to send them a URL to something else or download a different app just seems confusing when they're comfortable with that. Um, If they have no preference and they're quite happy and open to suggestion, then I really like Zoom. With sports injury fix, we we use Zoom and we advocate Zoom. Zoom is something that multinationals use, is a fantastic forum. And one of its advantages is you don't need to download anything. There's a sim- whoever the host is has the, has the app and the function, but then you just send that URL link to the clients and the clients can just join that meeting. It's as, it's as simple as it gets. Um, the, the pay, there's a free and a paid system. The free system allows you up to three people or three people or more to have a group meeting for up to 40 minutes. So you may want to do um, class sessions. You may want to do some forum where you've got multiple people within it, but you are limited to 40 minutes. On the free package one-to-one, then that time limitation is removed. There is a paid option, which isn't expensive. It's 10, 11 pound back here in the UK a month. Um, and that gives you the sort of, I think it's up to 100 people on a call and, and that unlimited time. Um, so we use Zoom. One of the things with Zoom compared to the likes of Skype, it's a really common finding with Skype about those glitches and the connectivity problems. Because Zoom is this standalone system, then it tends not to have the glitches that some of those do. Um, what, WhatsApp can do a video call as well. Um, but we, we like Zoom. One we've used as well is something called Whereby. Whereby is quite a nice system as well. Um, and we would, we would go with Whereby or Zoom ourselves. Um, the, um, a lot of the ones like Skype and some of the other ones, then that person needs to set up their own account. And there's that whole extra steps in the process for them that you can hopefully remove with Zoom. Now, um, some of the ones that you mentioned that are coming out, the, um, was it Doxy? Doxy that you mentioned? Yeah, so yeah, Doxy is, my, in my understanding, that is the one that GPs have been rolled out in the NHS now to use for their 
face-to-face stuff. I believe it was fundamentally a, a doctor, primary care physician, GP type system that's now being, being expanded. I, uh, I know Tim very well from Rehab My Patient. We've got a partnership with him at Sports Injury Fix. And Simon, who runs Rehab Guru, is a, a personal friend from the old military days. Um, fantastic guys with fantastic systems. And they're now trying to integrate some of this telehealth with their existing exercise prescription software. Now, um, with the likes of Clinico and some of those other ones, it feels like they're now trying to shoehorn uh, video technology into their platforms rather than using existing platforms of video technology and maybe integrating them alongside other systems that they use. So. So I would stick with the trusted things that work and everybody knows works. I've been using Zoom um, for all my patients since we, we closed the doors, but also with um, our team meetings with Sports Injury Fix. Now, we've had zero problems using Zoom, even whilst the world is now trying to use Zoom. And every man and his dog is sucking into the, the Wi-Fi and the internet connections. And I've had problems with Skype this week. I've had problems with FaceTime this week. And the only thing that's, that's been running happily is, is Zoom. So we're big fans of Zoom as well. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. We were expecting when we did our episode last night and tonight, oh, is, are the Zoom servers going to be able to cope with all the extra? But it's, it's just as stable as it's ever been. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, no, like we, the other nice thing, Sorry, Craig. The other yeah. nice thing with Zoom is um, it's secure. So you've got this, um, you can enable a waiting room facility and that controls access to these meetings. So um, you can lock the meeting so nobody else can join even though they've got the same URL and um, then unlock and add ex- access at the times and, and sessions that you want. Yeah. So you've I got think, that. Uh, yeah. I think there's two other, two other little things I could say about Zoom is in, in Australia, we have probably the world's worst worst internet speed connections and even when things are really bad for me here it's it zoom seems to work fine which is a big bonus but secondly i mean most universities around the world have been using it for quite a few years Um, most professional organizations are using it for meetings now pretty much every guest we have on pod chat live here um has is familiar with it they've already used it somewhere else before so it's so pervasive now that it that you know, the chances of um, doing an online consultation with someone, they probably have actually been exposed to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, just, I love, actually, I love, I, lo- I, lo- I really love that point about rather than sticking with one thing and saying, right, I'm going to use zoom or I'm going to use Clinico or whatever it may be. I love the idea of you as a clinician, having several accounts, being flexible uh, yeah. to remove the barrier at the other end. I think that's a really solid point. Yeah. Sorry, Craig, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, just before we move off the platforms, we just have had one comment from Liam, and this was applicable to, to um, something that happened last week here as well. Um, what about just the telephone? Yep, absolutely. I, <laughs> I, use, cool. I use the telephone. Um, we've got people who just, just need a chat because a lot of these people, they just want accountability. They want someone just to check in with. They want someone. It's not about these because what you're getting is a lot of the... the the difficulty some people are seeing is how to replace that in-person face-to-face with this online forum. But actually a lot of people, even when they come in to see us, it's just that holding someone accountable, checking in, reassuring people, giving them the confidence what they're doing is the right stuff. And if a phone call works for them. The other thing I'm a big advocate for with these guys is if I'm offering it, and I think now you're going to get more people with reluctance, then offer them a free session, offer them a little taster. You know, if someone's reluctant to take you up on this, well, look, here's a link. Let's have a chat. Let's do five minutes. It's completely free. It's a little taster session. If you think it's okay and you want to proceed with it, we can arrange an appointment. If it's not something for you, we'll find a different way to work and a different way to get it to happen. Um, yeah. But yeah, telephone is absolutely fine. And as you say, a lot of people, are. This, the world seems right now to be finding their way back to old school stuff of just spending time with people, the world is slowing down again. Yeah. My two sons today spent an hour each on the phone to their friends, just catching up with school friends because they weren't in school together. And um, it just gave me flashbacks to sitting on the stairs in my mum's house with a, and I couldn't go anywhere because the long wire. <laughs> yeah. they, were, they, um, weren't doing, they weren't doing, they weren't doing TikToks or anything like that to each other, were they? Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
We want to talk about cost in a minute, firstly, because you just mentioned about getting a free session. And also Steve Wells has just made a, a very solid comment that I want to bring up as well. But while it's in my mind, just before we move off of the platform thing, la last comment about it. Um, all the platforms we talk about in keeping with secure, secure enough measures that they are appropriate. So the two way encryption that, that these things will require, it, it, all of them, I'm guessing they are or they, they wouldn't be in the marketplace. But just, just to clarify, they're all appropriately encrypted and secure. The best of my knowledge, yeah. Yeah, great. As long as the other person isn't in Costa Coffee or something like that. And um, often that, 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 that was a, you know, it was said anecdotally, but you really will get, well, they won't get in now, hopefully, because nobody's allowed to go anywhere. <laughs> True. Even if they are in a house somewhere, because there's the, you know, you could, you could be uh, chatting to someone in their living room and the wife's on speakerphone to someone else in the back and then suddenly all this medical uh, confidential stuff is starting to spill out as and wherever it, it shouldn't yeah. be. Uh, so let's just, let's just do costs now, just while it's in, fresh in our minds. Um, Steve Wells has come up with a comment, do you have problems justifying the charge? And the reason I love the way that that's worded is it really speaks to the mindset that we're all in. And I don't just mean the patients, I mean us as clinicians as well. Already, we're, 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 and I'm there as well, we're all there. It's like, how could we justify the charge? Um, because clearly people are willing to pay for us to come into our clinic to see us, but why would they be why would they not see the same value in this? So I think there's a definite fundamental shift in, in mindset required by everyone involved, which ironically would, you know, behavior change is the most difficult thing, but a global pandemic is quite a significant catalyst for that. But let's, let's take Steve's question and sort of bring it into the, the whole debate about costs. Um, I'm not going to ask you what you charge, of course, but let's talk about the charges we, 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 we offer for online consults versus perhaps our clinic charges, because then everyone can use them as relative things. I've seen two arguments here. And the first is speaking to Steve's comment, which is no one really thinks this is the same value deep down because it's too new to everyone. So therefore, whatever we charge in clinic, let's call it X, these online consultations should be a, a percentage of X, whether it be 50% or whether it be 70% or whatever it may be. I've also seen the flip side of the argument, which is my time is my time. You, you pay for an hour of my time in clinic. You pay for an, an hour of my time online. Like you are getting me for a certain period of time. Therefore you charge. And I know some people that are very strong proponents that what you charge in clinic is what you charge online. Um, I guess what I'm asking you is where do you sit? Uh, not that it's going to be that dichotomous and polarized, but where do you sit on this discussion of cost? What, what are your, what's your experience with any, um, I guess uh, doing it long enough, you've probably heard all the comments from feedback from patients about this. What, what gems can you give us regarding cost? Yeah. So um, the big thing I've seen this week, as there are more and more people now taking this up, I've been involved heavily this week with both therapists and fitness instructors, personal trainers with the uptake of it. There's a real, real uh, trend in people undervaluing and underselling themselves. So I think it's important to not charge too little. Um, the time, when people pay for your time, they're paying for the years and years of training, experience and skills that you've put in to gain the qualifications and knowledge you have. And that's what the time is giving them. So it's important to realize you're still being able to pass on a lot of the skill and knowledge that you can. If you are someone who is sometimes a little bit more hands-on, um, one, one of the groups that I've had the most impact with this week was doing a webinar for the Sports Massage Association. Here's a bunch of hands-on therapists who just couldn't understand how they could offer benefit to their clients via online stuff. But we sort of give them some examples of how to be able to do teaching, self-massage, self sort of soft tissue work to themselves. And, and I think they started to see that. Personally, the way I do it is on pro rata for what would be the time that I would in the clinic. So my follow-up assessments are almost the same, same price as my in-person in ones because I tend to be about advice, assurance, exercise, self-management stuff, and then kick them out the door. I'm not someone for doing lots of things to people. So 30 minutes of my time in a follow-up isn't that different to see me in clinic. However, the big, the big elephant in the room with an initial consult is your objective assessment. And I know we're going to come on to that later as far as what you can and can't do. But there's time I would spend doing some objective stuff that I can't spend the same time in clinic, uh, out of clinic that I could in clinic. So effectively for me, what I do is I pro rata the time of my initial appointment in clinic to what I would charge online. 
However, the decision of what people charge is has to be made by that individual circumstance they find themselves in business overheads, outgoings, families. Um, and again, there's, you know, we are in a time where there'll be certain people affected very little by this financially and there'll be others who are drastically affected. So people will, people by people, I think that's an important thing to mention. So if someone wants to see you, they want to see you and actually right now, this is pretty much the only way they can see you. So to suddenly just give away sessions and time when you A, have a business and B, are giving away that time and knowledge, then don't undersell and value yourself, but really consider what you think is a fair price. Discuss it with your peers. If you're someone who runs a clinic and you've got trusted, regular, long-term patients, give them a free taster session to try out the technology, see what they think, get their feedback on how you are and what you do. And then spend five minutes saying to them, what do you justifiably think I should charge you for this? What would you be happy paying for this? These guys know you, they like you, they trust you. Pick their brains and see what, see what they say because um, they're the other interface in this, the other half of the connection. So, um, so my personal thing is I go pro rata for new appointments and I take a little bit off my, my follow-ups, but not a lot. But likewise, if someone in the past with some of my coaching stuff, if someone reaches out to me from the other side of the world, wanting my time and effort, and they're happy to pay sometimes whatever you ask them to pay, then don't be ashamed or feel bad that you're trying to justify your time appropriately, um, even if someone else doesn't think that's, that's an appropriate uh, reward. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting what you say about the massage therapist, because when I've spoken to clinicians, not, not massage therapists, but of, within podiatry and outside, it seems to be the ones that are most reticent or, or unsure about this sort of format um, might be the ones that do more passive things in clinic anyway. Therefore, if that's what they do in clinic, then they can't do it here. There was a great image actually, Craig, have you got it teed up, ready to go of, um, the ultrasound. Uh, oh, actually, table. I hadn't. I, I will, let me, so let you me just... see that up because it's been going viral over the last day. Um, I mean, they, I think the, the joke was that, you know, um, ultrasound being done, you know, if you hold the ultrasound probe, if they hold their knee up to the screen and you hold the ultrasound probe up to your screen, it's probably just as effective, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is it. I can't, I don't know what the source of this was because it was doing the rounds on so many different, uh, so many different social media channels. But yeah, um, you know, passive therapies. I think if you do a lot of passive therapies, you may be want be sort of sitting here thinking, how do online consultations work? But if you're, if the majority of your practice is already very much advice, education, reassurance, you know, building robustness, resilience, um, you know, self-efficacy, guiding people towards managing themselves, then then there's really no barrier here, is there? So um, let let's talk um, let's talk about some of the things before we get stuck into kind of, you know, what does a consultation look like? And I definitely want to go there. Um, let's get stuck into some of the things we should probably be teeing up logistically, putting in place before we roll this out. And I think we're all conscious that, that you know, we're all feeling time poor right now because all of a sudden, you know, the world's changed. We're suddenly being told face to face consultations aren't happening. A lot of us have got bills, overheads, children's mouths open, waiting for food. And the reality is we need, we need to start doing this stuff, but I want to make sure that people are aware that rather than just say, right, I'm going to start offering online consultations tomorrow. There's probably a few things to, to, to tee up first. Um, let's talk about some of the logistics. So first of all, uh, we've talked about appointment times and I think I'm right in saying you would essentially do online what you do in clinic, which is let's say an hour for an initial 30 minutes for a follow up. That wouldn't change per se. What about how people book in? So I guess what, what you don't want, if this is going to go well for you and take off is you don't want, emails flying into your inbox and having to individually reply to them and, and work out something in a diary. What sort of system do you use for people to book in? Um, I'm guessing it's some kind of online calendar, but can you talk us through some of the, some of the options there? Yeah. So the, the mistake you can make is something I certainly did a few years ago when I didn't have online booking facilities is you can easily slip away from the routine and regime of being in a clinic knowing your designated time slots and stick into those because you know someone's in the waiting room waiting to see you having that designated admin time and doing the paperwork and all, all the stuff you need to in and around what you would do with the patient 
And because you may be sat in a room in your house or you may be sitting somewhere and you're just chatting away, enjoying, then it's quite easy to slip away from that. And then the whole accountability and management and administration becomes a bit of a nightmare if you've, if you've lost track straight away. So whatever you do, you need to try and replicate your clinic. You need to have that template of your week, what hours, what days, when people can come and see, what admin time you're going to factor in to do each appointment, what your processes are from there. Because it's online, then it's, it's much easier if, if you have some online booking system. Um, so I use the Sports Injury Fix one naturally, and all I do is I add, as you would with an online appointment, and many people have them integrated to their websites already, is if you have a number of treatment session options on that website anyway, you just add a new one, online assessment or online follow-up or whatever, whatever it is you want. Um, and then you designate on your rotor and your diary hours what, what sessions are available. And then when you advertise and market for it or someone inquires about it, you can just send them those links to, to direct them there and, and take it from there. So that, that's the easiest way. Um, now, I do that primarily as well because the system allows people to pay up front. Um, it's hard for someone to run out the clinic without paying. But it's quite easy, especially if, if the session may not have gone as well as they think it should have then you end the call, you put it down, and to sit back and trust someone is going to then drop some money into your bank account, particularly at these times when we know finances are, are trying to be more and more justified by everyone. So some online payment is um, quite a nice way. Now, when I started doing this, I literally, if someone sent me a messenger or a Facebook message or whatever saying, could they, could they see me online? I would send them a, a little picture of my um, bank account number, my bank account number, I like, you know, drop the money in there, ping me a message when it's gone in, I'll check my bank and then we'll arrange a time and a date to, to set you up. Um, and when, when it was back in that format, then obviously I wasn't seeing that many online and it was quite easy to manage. But right now you could suddenly have this influx and if you're juggling who's paid what, when have they done it, how's it, how's it all working, then it can become a little bit difficult when there's already these other things to think about. So online systems work well. If you've got a current online system, just set in some slight tweaks to what sessions you've got. And then any sort of um, emails that you may send them or any notifications, instructions, reminders, then some of those need to be tweaked slightly just to state some of the things that are uh, unique to the online system, what, what clothing you might want them to wear, what setting you want them to be in, that you're gonna explain in the walkthrough process so thank you for booking online. You will receive this email. In the email there will be a link. You'll be put in a waiting room and then I'll invite you into the meeting. After the meeting, I'll do X, Y, and Z. Please wear these clothes. Please have this space. Make sure your connection's secure. All of those little prompts and, and reminders. Because the other thing you don't want is to lose time in each session and run on really late because of the, the technological problems and, and glitches of people not finding the link properly, not being able to open it up, not finding a secure internet connection. So just it gives you a, a, a confirmation email or reminder and then a few prompts to go alongside it. Perfect. So the, the message here is keep it online. An online diary booking system. We'll put some links to these below. We've got your one, Sports Injury Fix one. There's things like Calendly, Square, Shuddle. We'll link, we'll link some down there. Sync that in if you can with an online payment system um i know that you pay whether it be paypal i think square links the two as well your suggestion would be get payment before the consultation which i think is a really solid one i know that i've heard other people say that they do that too um and then get some get some templates ready get some standard responses letters emails whether you know booking confirmation setting expectations requirements from them um DNA policy? Do people DNA in online consultations? They can do. Um, you tend to get um, lots of cancellations rather than okay. DNAs. So, so a usual, um, a usual twenty-four hour industry standard. You will be. Yeah. This is why you get payment before, and if you cancel within twenty-four hours, you, you yeah, lose that payment. payment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you cancel but, within twenty-four hours, you get you lose your payment or you lose the percentage of the payment. Um, but you know. Um, as, what I never wanted to feel like when someone is asked to pay up front is that I don't trust them, trust anyone. Yeah. Um, 
Now, it's well within anyone's right to cancel any appointment as well. And if they give me the, the, the good thing here is, is and particularly in this climate now, if you cancel within that designated period and I don't get paid and you get your money back, then actually there's not much overheads for me right now because I'm sitting at home in the office. Um, I could probably fill it if I have enough time. Um, and obviously with an online booking system, when someone cancels it, then that slot just becomes available to whoever's searching for a slot. So, um, so nothing changes there as well. You know, if, if, if anyone watching afterwards is thinking, what is one take home from this? then fundamentally your clinic and the way you work and everything about you should change as little as possible. If it's all set up already. If you're old school and you don't use online booking and you don't use those things, then it can still work. But I would strongly advise that that's a switch you make as well to cover yourself and make sure everything's as slick as it can be. Yep. And then when they book out goes the, like you say, the booking confirmation, the expectations, the, the cancellation policy, the, for, the past medical history form, perhaps if you send one of those in and you can then read that beforehand. Um, uh, what else? expectations you've already said they include what the environment should, should be like so like you said be secure don't be in costa coffee can we just before we get on to the consultation itself speak to what our environment should look like so yeah. I, I'm, I'm conscious uh, i know I, I recently heard um our, our mutual friend adam meekins talk about just make sure you don't have a pair of pants on on the radiator behind you for you know for example but actually the logistics of it if you're you know for example i'm sitting right up against the corner of one of my rooms here and if this was a consultation i suddenly needed to um, uh, illustrate a single leg squat I'm going to have to move the camera back get me you know, so you need to be thinking about those things beforehand what sort of things is this consultation going to include could you just quickly speak to how we should set up our environment to, for it to look professional but also be be usable yeah so again it's about um, professionalism is the is the overarching thing so when I'm doing most of my talking stuff, I'm lucky I've got a little office at home and I feel this is appropriate, but I, I treat it as a working day. So I get up, you know, I make myself presentable. I put my uniform on if there's going to be a patient in front of me. Um, and, I, and you never know what the fastball is. So, so um, I may need to get up and demonstrate something or reach for something to show someone. So if I took a gamble sitting here in my polo shirt, but I was in my pants, then that's an unexpected variable that I would never do in the clinic. So, so the, <laughs> the question to always say to yourself is, would I do this in the clinic? And if the answer is a no to that, then it's probably not a safe thing that you should be doing at home, but have a well-lit room, try and look as professional as you can. Um, if you've got some sort of space, so the space is, is less important than the um, ability to adapt in that space. So for example, um, laptops are great, laptops are fine. But if I know I've got a session and it's gonna be a real physical session, I may use a mobile device because I can position it and I can use it slightly different. I've had lots of questions this week that people need to go out and buy camera rigs and lighting rigs, absolutely not. Most mobile phones these days are more than enough for what people need. But having a clear floor space, if it's something that you're gonna to do to get down on the floor and demonstrate something, um, making sure that you know just sort of I'll, I'll my office in the night becomes my working space and by the morning there's normally a couple of empty mugs and a couple of glasses and and stuff like that if you walked into the clinic in the morning you would clear away all the sort of dishware you tidy up your desk you do all that sort of stuff but use the space you've got because ultimately they're paying for your time so as long as you're not there there is a um, funny clip flying around today of a zoom meeting I think it's in the US but it might be Australia, I'm not sure, um, like 30 people on a Zoom call, and one of them doesn't realize his camera's on, and he is completely naked, and they all start <laughs> cracking up because this guy's just walking around his room talking naked. But the serious side of that is then that whole approach. Be conscientious that your camera's not accidentally on, your speaker's not accidentally on. If you're shouting to the missus or the partner in the other room about something, or if the kids, so for me, the big one for me is my two young lads. I'm, I'm very open with my two young lads. I love them coming in and, and knowing what I do. But they also know when there's a, there's a work time and there's someone on the end of the computer that's paying for my time, that the doors in between me, my space and their space get shut. They're you know, under strict instructions to try not to come in unless the house is on fire. 
Um, but likewise, at the same time, mm. if they were to wander in, then I try to be as natural about it as well. I'm not chastising them and kicking them out. It's like, oh, come and say hello quickly and, you know, off you go sort of thing. Then I'll have a quick apology to them. It, it never happens, but if it did. But it's just thinking about what would you do in clinic and do the same at home. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> So let's get to the fun stuff, the, the consultation itself, because I think a lot of people watching us kind of, kind of thinking to themselves, well, what, what, what does that look like? And again, it depends on what your, I guess it depends, how different this is probably depends on how you practice in clinic anyway. So for some people, this might, might not be that different, but um, we'll, we'll talk about um, just some, some v vague areas and then we'll, we'll try and make it a bit more podiatry specific. Um, it's pretty clear that the subjective, is going to massively outweigh the 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 objective which it's i think the the, the discourse here is for a lot of us maybe in our clinics it the, the shift the balance might be slightly more towards the objective we always talk about just how crucial taking a good history is and if it's crucial in clinic then i mean it's it's everything here right and i i, I was we were talking offline just before we went live and i said the one good thing that might come out of this whatever the world looks like in several months time is that anyone that's been doing a lot of these um, whether they continue to do them or not, is, is, I don't know. But the one thing is that whatever, however good your history taking is, it's probably going to be better. Um, so could you just say, uh, speak to sort of that subjective, objective balance, um, a bit about sort of uh, what, 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 how you start the call as well. So I recently heard Ben Cormack talk about this. He's very laid back and relaxed and, and um, very, a real character. And he said, like, don't, don't be yourself, essentially. If when you normally get someone in from the waiting room and you walk to your clinic and that first 30 seconds is small talk, then when you first go online here, that's okay to do. You know, that rapport building, that therapeutic alliance, being human, not feeling like this is, this is that kind of robot on the end of the 111 call of the NHS. So can you just speak to how the, the first few, those, those crucial first few minutes of the consultation for you normally go and then, and then just that subjective, objective balance? Yeah, so I completely agree with Ben. Um, what I find with it, so if you think when you're in clinic, one of the things, well, I think one of the things to blame for people rushing subjectives is because there's this expectancy that there's machines, gym kit, a plinth, something sitting there that we're all waiting to go and play with. Certainly you feel sometimes the patient is waiting for you to take them over to play with it. Now all that stuff's been removed, all that baggage in some ways is gone. So you have this face-to-face -face ability to talk to someone without that expectancy. So you've almost got an opportunity to, to expand that and, and discuss things. Um, I am a big fan of the chit-chat. Now, where I think it's super important is if you start doing online and it's a follow-up for someone that's seen you already in clinic. Because all of a sudden, everything's changed for them. They're on a different format. They're not there in clinic with you. It's all a bit weird to them. If you are you and you're yourself and you're consistent, then brilliant because it just gives them that no like and trust and that reassurance that they already expect. I've seen some other people do this. I remember I did a, um, so what I did one day this week was a friend of mine who'd set up this as a therapist said, can I give you a call and you be the patient for me to practice? Of course you can give me a bell. And just like your mum, he had this best phone voice that suddenly came on. And I'm like, whoa, that's not you. That's not how you talk. I know you and your clients know you. Just be yourself. So I'm a big fan of the follow-ups. You know, if someone comes into clinic and it's the first time they've seen me since they went on holiday or they went to their daughter's 21st birthday or whatever, how was the wedding? How was the holiday? How's things? Have that chat. I think with an initial assessment, exactly the same. I, I try to reassure them, you know, oh, um, oh, that's a cool painting behind you, or that's a cool picture, or oh, those heads, headsets, I've seen them before, you know, and how do you find those sort of things? What are you using? You're using your phone, how, you know, just set the scene and, and break down some of those barriers that sometimes can be there because you've got this this computer and this internet barrier between yourselves. When it comes to the actual subjective then, then the same rules apply. It, it's, it's getting that knowledge that you want out of them. Now, all of a sudden, you've got this time to just shut up and listen. But you have to avoid those awkward silences because suddenly you could just be staring at each other through the screen going, okay, this is weird. <laughs> um, and, and it's sometimes less 
um, less easy to fill some of those dead spaces in this forum. So, but it's okay to have silences as well, of course, and, and just let people speak. Um, what you can have here, I'm a big fan of the eye contact, but you can have prompts and things here that you could never have in the clinic. So almost always I've got a post-it note on my laptop just there, which they can't see, just going, shut up for two minutes. Just let them talk. Just let them tell me the story because they, they've got this captive audience now. And if I'm looking around or butting in, it's almost worse than in clinic. But once I start the subjective, nothing changes. I need the same information. I need the same things out of them. It's your past medical history, history, present condition, all the sort of occupational background, social background, just getting their beliefs and their values and all the stuff out of them. And then just having a conversation, just letting it be in relaxed, flowing, going off on the tangents as you need to, pulling them back in sometimes as you need to. But there's so much gleaned, as we know, from that subjective portion that suddenly you've almost got that this this less expectancy and pressure of a reduced objective that's due. So maximize what you can get out of that time. Don't be any different than you normally are and just just use the knowledge um some people will so it depends what you want to do as well sometimes i'll keep a notebook and i'll make some notes so it's important for me at the start to just say to them look i have got a notebook i'll be making some notes i am listening if i look down please don't worry i've come away from that quite a lot now now i do tend to just record them so i know i can just listen to you how many times would we love to sit in clinic and be able to know we're recording this and i can go back and listen and delve into whatever bit of it I want to afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and, and on that note, Ben Cormack to name drop him again, words this beautifully and says, instead of worrying about the things that you can't do in this format, uh, really focus on the things that you can do and, and do them better, do them well, double down on that subjective. What does an objective look like? Cause we, we need to take objective measures in a lot of things we do. So how do we test for things like strength, endurance, range of motion? I guess you have to be, you, you, you have to be, um, inventive. Um, you know, what, what, what sort of tools would you use or, or cues would you give? Yeah. So obviously it depends on who it is and what, what they've come to see you for and the situation that, 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 that consultation's happening. Um, the big things too, so movements, movement screens, movement assessments and, and tasks are probably your big go-to. Of course, you can ask people to do range of movements and you can get them to feedback. Um, we talk, talked offline and you gave a really good example about using reference points on clothing and anatomical points to see how things feel and restrictions. Um, but I'm more of a, as the way I operate and the clientele that I tend to work with, then I am much more of a gross movement assessment type person. So I'll, I can easily get someone to do squats and car phrases and all of those things. It's the communication that's the key thing to change in an objective. So um, don't be shy. Don't be scared of being rather firm with them. I often, I often see sometimes they'll put the camera somewhere and it's not quite, I did a knee to wall with someone this week and the camera was okay, but it wasn't perfect at all. And they were well into this test and they were just going for it. And it needed me to just go, um, can you just stop there? I can't quite see your leg. The camera's fine. If you can shift back six inches, use a reference, you know, there's a bookcase to your left. If you just stand a little bit closer to that, perfect. Forward a bit, perfect. Now do the test again, please. So, so you have to have that uh, sort of firm manner, but friendly manner to just dictate what you need them to do. Um, I know Tom Goom, if we're going down the name dropping thing, we'll throw Tom in. Um, Tom uh, mentions you could record object, any more complex objective measures that you may want, record a little video, ping it to them first in that some of, some of that pre-consultation paperwork. Um, so they can look, digest, understand the movements that you may need them to do and practice it. Um, but I think it's a case of you, you do have to use what you can with that communication, with the space available. You won't get a full objective in. That's the thing to lay out from the start. It won't be everything you would like to do. It may not give you the answers, everything you want. And it certainly is more of a working hypothesis. And again, be quite open at the end of it and say to them, look, 
hands-on face-to-face, there would be some other things I'd have done, which may have given me more confidence in what I would like to give you as an answer. However, with this forum, I've seen enough and I've listened to enough that you said that it leads me to believe we're along these lines. Therefore, we're going to follow this approach. Is that okay with you? And then they'll go fine. And if you sort of said, you know, there's a potential differential diagnosis, it's this. Feel free to go off and have a look at it, research it, read up on it. There are some other tests. These are tests you may want to go and look at. If you feel confident and you want to try them and let me know how you get on, then please feel free to do that. But it is just finding the most appropriate objective measures you can do, staying calm, staying in control, have almost becoming more of a coach, more of a coach and an instructor to guide them through some basic things. Um, and then, let me let me quickly rudely interrupt you, breaking the rule the rules of video communication, and just a, a, a large portion of what we do musculoskeletally would, would be a gait analysis, which clearly in this setting um, there's, there is a limitation. But you mentioned we could we could you know pre pre setup uh, we could send like this is how to do a lunch test. Could we? Uh, is it reasonable? Is it feasible that we could say look? Normally in clinic we would take video of you running or walking at a self selected speed. This is this is the angle we would take and where we would position the camera. If you could capture some video of this beforehand and, you know, ping it to me and then I'll review it. Is that a reasonable workaround or is there a better way that gate analysis could work in your, in your opinion? No, absolutely. Why not get, you know, if you've got um, a partner or someone who can film themselves doing that. And again, it's, it's all about the preparation work you put in. You don't need a hundred tests. To, to be all set up to start off. You can evolve your process as, as you go along, but you may have a website, you may have a YouTube channel, uh, Dan Lawrence here in the UK, physio channel. Dan's got tons and tons of objective tests and measures that can be uh, applied, self-applied, and they're all on his YouTube channel. So Dan will just send a link, I assume, to these people to, this is the test I need you to do. Um, but yeah, film yourselves. You know, I certainly get runners who are overseas that I'm working with to fill, get someone to film them running or set a camera up and again your your instructional video may not be so much a example recording but you might just walk them through the setup this is the sort of space you want this is how i would put the camera and you can be as detailed as you want you know i'd rather you have it on on um, landscape rather than portrait try to be about five to ten meters away use it on x speed or y speed and then you can send me it using this platform they're all the sort of pre-workup stuff you can get to, to assist and facilitate yeah. more objective measures. So it comes back to what we said earlier, which is you've got to, you've got to plan and prep this stuff. You've yeah. got to have your, your, whether it be the paperwork you send out, the YouTube videos on your own channel of the, of the assessments you're going to ask them to do that they can, you can send them the links to, or, or even the YouTube videos of the rehab that you, the most likely rehab or the regular rehab you're giving people. So afterwards, which we're coming on to now, you can send links to say, here's your homework. Um, Craig, how are we for time? Um, yeah, we're getting pretty short on time, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So let, let's, let's wrap up and talk about um, what treatment looks like. Cause like I say, it's going to be, I'm guessing uh, based on knowing you well and, and having chatted about this before advice, education, reassurance uh, improving resilience robustness self-efficacy giving them homework like we say giving them rehab being a coach giving them youtube uh, youtube links and things is there is there anything else that, that we haven't covered already that, that needs to be said with regards to the, the post i mean afterwards do you send them a report after when the clinic uh, when the clinic sorry when the appointment finishes and you say right great do, you, do they then expect a report to drop into their inbox the same way you would dictate a report in clinic, a report with, therefore, a few links to a few videos? What does the post-consultation care look like? Yeah. Um, for want of a better word, the, my, they get an email reply from me. They get an email report, which is they're told about it in the pre-assessment or the pre-consult paperwork, and then I remind them at the end. So I'll say... Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is what I think it is. I'm going to send you a follow-up email. In that, it'll be everything we've chatted about today. Um, I'll explain a little bit about the condition we've discussed. Some of those exercises I'll confirm. Some of, some people would use a PDF. Some people would use a YouTube link. Some people may film it themselves and send it on. I'll also stipulate what I need you to do and how often and when I think you should book in, if needed, to come back and see me. The links for booking and they'll be back on. Um, but please feel free to get in touch anytime offline as well. And does that all make sense? And then that whole confirmation and reconfirmation of it. 
Yeah. I do ask them as well. I said, I've recorded the assessment. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to send you a copy of it so you can watch back in your own time? Not that many do want it. So normally then it's just, okay, I'll, I'll delete it. And, and then I send them confirmation it's been deleted. But normally it's, if you want a copy, I can send you it as well. And then I yeah. just do my own admin and paperwork from there. And I think recording them is important. First thing to say is Nikki made a comment at one point, how do you record? Certainly Nikki on Zoom, we, rec we record this right now. There's a button that just you just hit record before you start. I think most of the platforms probably yeah. have that. You, you ask for consent for that, of course, um, I'm guessing. Um, and if you great that you can give them a copy but i had a great tip again it was from it was from adam um when him and ben did the better clinician project webinar that said don't be afraid to record them and watch yourself back particularly if you're new to this particularly as we all as a lot of us uh, certainly in podiatry are reflect your review and, uh, and appraise yourself um you may find that you have weird little nuances where you keep touching your face or, or um or, or things that you say or that you or phrases that you, you use. I, I never actually listen back to any of these Podchat Live episodes myself uh, just because I'm, I'm terribly sensitive and I don't want to see how bad I was. But I think if you're doing this and, and you're, you're charging people for this, don't be afraid to re review and reflect on your, own, on your own things. Loads of other stuff that's come in question wise. A few things I wanted to talk about, things like red flag pathways or what if we decide we need imaging. I can just tell because I know Craig well by his body language, we're getting close to the hour. And when we go over an hour, the pod, the podcast has to be in two parts. So, Craig, is there anything urgent or are you keen to Look, wrap there, up? There, there was one comment that's been made earlier on by, by Terry, and, and this is more a question for you and me, Ian, um, and it's been weighing on my mind since he posted it. And he asked, with the possibility of having a 3D scanner on our phones, do you think it's possible to do a real podiatric assessment and a custom photothesis? Yeah, I can tell by your facial expressions. Your, <laughs> but no, but I, again, yeah, I, 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 I can see question. people trying to do that. And, and I, I, I certainly probably have a problem with that. Um, yeah, I think the orthosis discussion is one that we definitely don't have time to go into. We probably, yeah. this is probably worthy of a, of a, of a volume too, because there's a few other questions that have come up that, that, you know, what foot and ankle evaluations would be done well versus w which wouldn't be quite so reproducible. Steve Wells just mentioned now our, our, our COP, which is our version of your CSP, Mike. Um, COP guidelines say not to record. Well, that's, that's just classic COP for you, isn't it? Um, so there's loads of other stuff we should do. This probably deserves a volume two. And, and the reality is the way the world is going, um, people will probably have an appetite for a volume two. So perhaps we can think mm -hmm. about the orthosis stuff and, 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 mm -hmm. and come back and do that if you're yeah. up for that, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, between coming back or, or whatever, what I would suggest with the guys asking that type of podiatric specific stuff, play around with it. Phone mm. each other, set up this, phone each other, practice these tests on each other, see which ones work, which ones don't. Some will, some won't. And just, you know, the time for inno innovation and invention is now. We have a chance to revolutionize it. It may be a real short term solution for some people a long-term solution for others or just a string in their bow that they can dip in and out of if needed. Yeah. Well, I think we, we haven't even touched on, and again, I'll just share this, this whole, this was a thread on podiatry arena going back to 2005 on the use of telemedicine on diabetic foot ulcers. And, you know, a lot of, lot of research there that has been done. We haven't even touched on the potential on the in that area as well. I mean, it's, it's nothing new. It's, it's, um, but I think on that note, we, you know, I just, again, I do apologize to everyone for finishing up in, at, on the hour. If we go over an hour, the podcast version has to be in part one and part two, and no one listens to part two. So we, we could, we, this is obviously a topic we could keep going. I think you're right in maybe we need to revisit this again sooner rather than later. So for those that have just joined um, Facebook, do render this. The whole video will be available shortly. It will be up on YouTube in a few hours. So look, thanks so much, Mike. It's gone so quickly. And I can tell by that, and a lot of comments we haven't even had time to respond to. So, um, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, for that. Really appreciate thanks it. Both. Hope everyone stays well, stay safe. Absolutely, absolutely.